Welcome to the Marriage Today Show. I'm Jimmy Evans. As we near our 300th episode of the Marriage Today podcast, we're looking back at some of our favorite moments on the show. Today, we're highlighting some of our favorite question and answer portions of the show. Okay, we're going to begin with some questions uh, for, from our viewers. And this one's for you. It says, my spouse blames me for the problem in our marriage, the problems in our marriage. I'm not saying I'm without fault, but there's, uh, but there's no accountability or ownership on his part. What can I do? First of all, it's just classic Adam and Eve. <laughs> he <laughs> yeah. said she did. Yeah. So uh, the blame thing's been around since the beginning yeah, of time. Sure. You know, I mean, that's where it all began. You know, Eve sinned and then she blamed the devil and Adam blamed Eve. And yeah. so it's just been a recycling thing ever since. And yeah. one of the things that you and I learned in our marriage is, you know, we can't change each other, but we can change ourselves. And in, you know, working on my own behavior, I learned that you know, how I treat you um, and, and my part of it is just as important as what you do. Sure. And it, you always like to say the, the person does the right thing first is the one that's, you know. And so I think it's just that, you know, you're, it's two people in the same situation. And so mm-hmm. it's just not even I don't understand how you can't not take ownership of a problem in any marriage because it's two people. Well, let me go back to the beginning of our marriage, and that is I was the problem, and I blamed you for everything. Mm-hmm. I truly believed you were the problem, <laughs> and, and I didn't have any accountability. You know, you would complain to me, and I you know, I didn't care. And I, we, we went to a Sunday school class um, that you got us in. I didn't want to go to Sunday school, but <laughs> you wanted us to go. So I went to, we went to a Sunday school class, and we had a big fight one morning, and I left for work. I was probably around 21, 22 years old, and uh, I left for work and I came home from work that day and I was ready for round two. I just thought, she's still mad. I'm I'm ready to go. And I walked in the door and you said, well, before you get comfortable, we're going out to eat with Carmen and Ethel tonight. That was our <laughs> Sunday school teachers. And I said, what? So we went out to eat dinner that night. Well, and- what you didn't add to that is I'd already packed my bags and I was ready to leave. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would rather you left than you want to meet with Carmen and Ethel, probably. But, so we went out to eat that night with Carmen and Ethel. And um, they're real nice people. You know, they were, we were in their early 20s, early 20s, they were probably in their mid 40s or something. And, and the, the dinner was um, about, it was awkward in the beginning. And then Kerm turned to me in the dinner and for about 45 minutes basically said, I used to be an idiot like you when I first got married and blah, blah, blah. But what, what it did was it established some accountability. Mm-hmm. I had no accountability. And what you did was you reached outside. Mm-hmm. of the marriage and you brought some people in and it was helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, it was embarrassing to me, but it was helpful. And and the thing that was helpful to me also, Karen, was when Karen was saying, I I was like you mm-hmm. and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And to see the, the consequences of that. So um, I think that counseling is the very best thing you can do when you get to this kind of a, a position where there is no accountability. Uh, she says ownership on his part. Go outside, and even if your spouse won't get counseling, go get counseling for yourself. Mm-hmm. Improve yourself, and uh, it'll help your marriage. That's good. My wife gives most of her time to taking care of the kids. She says they won't be here forever. How do I get her to realize I'm important too? Well, this is a common thing too. Um, I think that a lot of women get caught up with you know being a mother, especially if they had infertility issues at yeah. the beginning and then they finally have that child it's like ah oh. and so um i think it's just an, an instinct within us to, you know to nurture take care of our children and and they're easier than sometimes you know with our husband because our husband's busy working and we're we're with the kids but this is a dangerous thing very dangerous, very dangerous. because the kids are not going to be with you forever no. and so if she can say well they won't be there forever but then if they aren't then what are you going to do after they're gone? Because you don't have a marriage. I know so many couples that their their the relationship they had to rebuild it. They had to go through all the process again of rebuilding the relationship because they didn't take care of it when they were married, or they end up in divorce, or just miserable. Mm-hmm. Um, that we we've had an empty nest, Karen, for twenty six years, mm-hmm. and um, and so you know we our kids are in their forties. They we have five grandchildren, and so it's so short sighted to give up your marriage for your children. The other thing is, how are your children going to succeed in marriage if you don't show them how? Exactly. When not only, not and they, and, and they feel like they're the center of your universe. That's not a healthy environment. Yeah. And so your God is first, your marriage is second, then your children. 
you love each other first, and then you love your children, and that makes them feel secure. And then when they leave home someday, they have the the no the knowledge of how to have a successful relationship. Very dangerous thing. Um, I feel disrespected by my wife. What can I do to establish respect? Well, the the thing that I think it, it's hard. It, it's hard when someone's disrespecting you. You just can't make them respect you. Mm-hmm. And in this teaching that we're going to go to here in just a minute, and this is also now in my book, Marriage on the Rock, and also in the, the seminar, Marriage on the Rock, the number one need of a man is honor. Number one need, period, no no question mark. No, no, it's, uh, it is absolutely the number one most profound need that a man has. And so when women, a lot of times women will see men as egotistical. And it's like, you're just too sensitive. You know, you're just too egotistical. It's just the way God made us, you know, is, is so you can, in other words, you can say anything you want to me, but the way you say it is very important to me. And we're very, very sensitive in the area of our egos. And what this man is saying is, I feel disrespected by my wife. You need to get counseling. You need to read the book together. You need to do whatever, but uh, it'll never change. Uh, this, a man will always need respect. And it, the, it says in Ephesians 5, by the way, that a woman should Respect her husband as she does Jesus. The standard there is, how would you talk to Jesus? How would you respond to Jesus? Well, what you're saying is, is what I was about to say, is talk. Words are powerful. You and I were just talking about this this morning, about how, you know, words can bring life or death, and they can bring—and bring, so what women need to understand is the words that you speak in your home are producing something in your home, yeah. either a good crop or a bad crop. And so the words you speak, if they're gracious and kind, then you're going to experience gracious, kind atmosphere. But if they're demeaning and disrespectful and putting people down, and, you know, it, it, that's the atmosphere you're building. And so in the home, a woman's words can produce such great things. My wife says that she prayed and God told her to divorce me. Before she served me with a divorce notice, I felt that God told me to serve my wife and to love her unconditionally. Oh, these are conflicting statements, and it feels like my God against her God. How do I know which is true? Well, it's true. You know, when she, when she says, you know, if if this wife says that she prayed and God told her to divorce him, uh, I would think that she had biblical grounds. Yeah. So the the biblical grounds for divorce, according to Matthew 19, would be, uh, adultery. But, you know, it's not just adultery. It is serial adultery. It's unrepentant sexual sin. Just because your spouse uh, cheats on you one time, it doesn't mean you have to divorce them. You could, because uh, it does violate the covenant of the relationship. But you can also forgive them. But but what it's really talking about there, because when, when Jesus said, if, if any man divorces his wife except for porneia, that's the word. It means egregious, unrepentant sexual sin. And so if your spouse is a cheater, and they have been, uh, you know, surely unfaithful. Well, obviously, that that warrants a divorce. You know, if you wanted a divorce, then in First Corinthians seven, the Apostle Paul is talking about a believer married to an unbeliever, and is talking there about not just an unbeliever, but someone who refuses to put faith in God. In other words, this is in in the the two issues there are abandonment and abuse. The Apostle Paul says, if an unbelieving spouse will not live with a believing spouse. The believing spouse is free. Well, there's a couple of ways to say, I'm not going to live with you. One is to abandon you, okay? And the other one is to beat the heck out of you <laughs> or to abuse you. And so, uh, pastor, you know, been a pastor for 40 years, and, and Karen, we've helped a lot of people mm-hmm. in marriages. And so, if this wife is saying to her husband, the Lord told me to divorce you, um, I would think in that marriage there would be serial adultery abuse or abandonment. Now, if there isn't, she's not hearing God. And a lot of people will say they hear God to justify an action. So let me let me just say here, unless there's a biblical reason for her to divorce him, she's not hearing God. But I believe what he's saying, Karen, mm-hmm. is God. Mm-hmm. You know, if if he's saying, in spite of the fact that my wife's divorcing me, the Lord is speaking to me to love her unconditionally. Well, that's what the Bible says. Mm-hmm. You know, that's First Peter three, and so I, at this point, not only knowing what we know from the question, I would I would vote for him, yeah. and I would just say he's probably hearing God, she's probably not. Mm-hmm. We well, you know the scripture comes to my mind while you're talking, not to anything about what her she's saying, but is 
I, when I when I was young, when I'd read the scripture about what Jesus was telling the Pharisees, you know, that they wanted a divorce, and Moses let us get divorced, and God and Jesus said it's because of your hard hearts. That's right. And that stuck with me as a young you know, wife, is I remember thinking, oh my gosh, your heart could be so hard that you could believe something and it not be true. Yeah. And so you know and. I, you know, that's another thing that, with a, as a woman anyway, that we do have to check ourselves. We have to check and see, ask ourselves, what's really in our heart? What's really coming out? Because your words will manifest what's oh, in yeah. your heart. Oh, yeah. You know, and, it, you know, so there's probably a lot more, you know, that's not being said here. And, um, yeah, the, and it would be helpful really to know more of the details, mm-hmm. but it, it, it is in the hardness. If you're unforgiving, well, the other thing to put it is because Ephesians 4 says, be angry, don't sin. Don't go to bed on your anger, or you'll give the devil a foothold. The word devil there is uh, diabolos, it means slander. Mm -hmm. When you go to bed on anger, you actually open a door to the devil, and you can think you've heard God, but you've actually heard the devil. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very dangerous thing. It is. My wife and I have been married for 16 years, and I still struggle with her past. She had a one-night stand when we were dating, and it still hurts me to think about that after all these years. I know she would change the past if she could, why can't I get over this? Forgiveness. Forgiveness? Yeah. I mean, sometimes you just need to, someone to walk you through forgiveness. Yeah. Because if you can't forgive something that happened before they even got married, I mean, because that's, he's still holding her account. She, she's in an account with him right now. She owes him a debt. Mm-hmm. that he She's done something bad and he can't get over it. So she, it's like she's never going to be able to do enough to make it him happy. I agree. It's going to be his heart. It's going to, it, you know, he's going to have to either find a counselor or talk to her and just. Go through the process of forgiveness, and um, but it doesn't sound healthy to me at all. That you know, if, if this is his mindset, I would definitely think that he's needs to go through forgiveness. Um, Matthew eighteen, Jesus told the uh, story about a man who was forgiven ten million dollars of debt by his master, mm-hmm. and then he went and found a fellow slave that owed him a few hundred dollars, mm-hmm. and he wouldn't forgive him, and he began to beat him. And the master came back and said, "You throw this slave." into prison and turn him over to the tormentors until he has paid back everything he owes. And Jesus said, so my father will do to each of you if you don't from your heart Mm -hmm. forgive your brother their trespasses, which in this case means your wife. Unforgiveness is torment. Mm -hmm. Unforgiveness literally opens us up to demonic torment. Mm -hmm. So he says, why can't I get over this? I, I agree with you, Karen. He hasn't forgiven her. But that lack of forgiveness opens a door for literally the devil to constantly torment you. With the thoughts of what she did. <laughs> and that she could do it again. You know, it's just, it's, it's a it's a wound that you just keep picking the scab at constantly. So I, I totally agree with that. Okay. Um, My husband and I own a business together. It has worked well for us, but I'm struggling with balancing our work life with personal time to invest in each other. How do we make sure we stay connected to each other and talk about more than just the business? You have to have some margin uh, when when you have a there has to be a time when you shut the door uh, and, and this is even more critical if you work from home mm-hmm. that you shut the door close your computer turn off the phone and just have time together mm-hmm. and you're not talking about the business it's just personal time the problem comes when you work together that everything just there's you're working too much uh, you're spending too much energy in the business. And you don't have the emotional energy to spend on each other. You need to be having a date night. You need to have time of just being together, of just hanging out and just being together. 
Um, you know, it's the old saying, Karen, if the devil can't get in front of you and stop you, he'll get behind you and push you too fast. Mm -hmm. And the epidemic in our society today is stress. Mm -hmm. And God just simply didn't design us to operate under stress. We were designed to operate under rest. Well, and their relationship shouldn't be built on a business. It That's should be right. built on them and God. And so what if something happens to the business? You uh, know, what's exactly. going to do their relationship? Exactly. Well, she says they get along well. Uh, you know, that, that it's worked well for us, which means that the foundations of your relationship are generally good. But what is eroding, it sounds like, is the personal relationship. Mm -hmm. The business is becoming this uh, globalized monster that's kind of eating up everything there. And I'm just saying, create a firewall. Just say, we're going to work this much. We're going to go home. We're not going to talk about business. We're going to be together. We're going to work on a relationship. Mm -hmm. And just make that kind of a, of a commitment, and if you do that, that's great. You're, you, you can easily succeed in business and succeed at home. Home comes first. Even if you can't do enough business, even if you have to create a firewall of saying no to somebody, don't say no to your spouse. It's, it's a very dangerous thing. My wife treats me more like her child rather than her friend. It's very emasculating. What can I say to get through to her? Well, <clears throat> you know, this, this goes to two dynamics. Um, the, the, you know, the worst thing on earth is to try to change something that's unchangeable. Okay. And the way that God made men and women is just simply unchangeable. Mm -hmm. So if I refuse to accept your nature, then what happens is I'm constantly violating you because I can't change your nature. It's unchangeable. And this is what happened early in our marriage is I just thought you're weird. You're not like me. Your needs are not like <laughs> mine. So I rejected you. Well, I learned that doesn't work. Okay. But with men, there are two needs that men have that are very, very important, and they're unchangeable. The first is respect, okay? Mm that I want you to respect me. And the way you say something to me is as important to me as what you're saying. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to hear when I'm being disrespected. Mm -hmm. okay? That's just the way men are. We're just very sensitive in our egos. Just God made us that way. Mm -hmm. It's the number, it's the mega need of men. And I, I say to women, and I say to men too, you have to encrypt everything you say in your spouse's language. So a, a woman's number one need is security. Mm -hmm. So if a husband's going to be able to communicate to his wife, he has to communicate, you're first. Mm -hmm. I'll do anything to meet your needs. There's nothing that's going to come before you. I'll sacrifice to make sure you're okay. And women are great. But with a wife, she has to encrypt everything she's saying. That She's saying, with, I respect you. Mm -hmm. You're a good man. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe in you. The second uh, need that a man has is friendship mm -hmm. with his wife. We want to be buddies with our wives. So when you treat your husband as a child, mm -hmm. not only are you violating, this is what he's saying. My wife treats me more like her child than her friend. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you fall in love being friends. You don't, you don't fall in love because you disrespect each other. Mm -hmm. So with a man, when you're dealing with a man, he needs respect and he wants to be your buddy. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you honor the way that God made him in that regard, it's great. And it says, what can I say to get through to her? I talk to her and I go to counseling. I think that, uh, and also my books, Marriage on the Rock, and also uh, Four Laws of Love, talk about the differences between men and women. I think reading a book together and also going to counseling would be a good idea to break through in this area. That's good. Um, I got a question for you. Okay, but I was going to say something about that. Okay. Because this is the thoughts that came to my mind when you were reading that. Because um, the 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 thing about mothering, I think it's awful. I think when women try to mother their spouse. I mean, I know I do that with you sometimes, and I know in the past I have. And, you know, I agree with you. It is emasculating. But my thoughts, too, when you were saying that is, you know, as a woman, I don't mind being fathered. 
you know, but I think men don't like being mothered. <laughs> and so, you know, because I'm going to argue with that. Just a I don't mind being fathered. And so, <laughs> and so, but the thought I had was, you know, as a woman, our number one need is security. Right. And so sometimes I think women act out out of insecurities. Oh, absolutely. And not feeling secure. Absolutely. And if the husband's not um, playing the role of protective, you know, meeting the I'm not saying that, that everything you said was right, but I just had this well, thought. Well, I'm, I'm going I'm to put a different word on it. Okay. And it's not fathering, it's pastoring. Okay. I think that a, that a husband should pastor his wife mm -hmm. and that spiritually take care of her, emotionally take care of her, practically take care of her. To where she feels pastored. She feels, mm -hmm. you know, like she's being, uh, she has a friend and she has a guard and she has a guide there. No one dominating or disrespecting her. But I do think that women like to be led mm -hmm. and they like to be pastored. Um, but but you're exactly right. When women, A lot of times when women are acting out, they feel insecure. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's, this is my thought. I mean, I hate it when I act like a mother. I hate it. I, I mean, I still have a tendency to do it with my kids. Like, oh, yeah, I'm not your mother anymore. Excuse me. <laughs> because we have it in our instinct to mother, to take yeah. care of. Hey, this is Brent Evans with Exo Marriage. And I want to thank you for listening to the Marriage Today podcast. We believe your marriage has a 100% chance of success if you do it God's way. If you enjoyed today's teaching and want to keep learning, hey, subscribe to the Marriage Today podcast and take some time to leave us a review. Your reviews help us spread the word and can encourage someone else in need. For more great marriage content, check out exomarriage.com where you can see all of our marriage building resources, articles, and live events.